Um, as Russell mentioned, Okay, um, so as Russell mentioned, um, we have this unique opportunity to look what Molokini was like in the absence of, of tourism. It was a unique, unprecedented, natural, quote unquote, natural experiment. And so before I get into that, um, Kevin was the lead author on it. Um, myself, Laura from DAR, Whitney, who's with me with National Geographic and my former student, and then, and then Russell as well. Um, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know at this point, but um, we all need healthy oceans in Hawaii for the myriad reasons that are up here on the screen, whether it's culture or sustenance, commerce, recreation, aesthetic, science. You know, we live surrounded by the oceans and we all know the importance of having a healthy ocean. That said, um, the ocean's facing a lot of different threats. Um, these are just a few of them, overfishing, destructive fishing practices, sedimentation from various means and coastal development, invasive species, particularly limu, plastic pollution, and then, and then climate change. So all of these things kind of are working synergistically, and it's almost death by a thousand cuts. Um, I'm just going to focus on the overfishing part, because this is one of the things that we actually can control. And Molokini is an example of that. It's a marine life conservation district where no fishing is, is allowed. And several years ago, we looked at um, fish biomass from visual surveys from across the state from a, an extensive 20-year data set. And, and we looked at this by MOKU, because MOKU is kind of a more typical way to manage marine resources, particularly in, in ancient Hawaii. So you can see, um, well, obviously the star advertiser picked it up. Uh, in the bottom right hand, you'll see that figure there that shows the biomass of fish by moku. So the orange moku, primarily around Oahu, South Maui, and West Maui, show extremely low biomass, particularly compared to remote places like Niihau or Anahola in Kauai. Um, most of Mo or North Shore of Molokai for the most part, and also the island of Koalaba, interestingly enough, despite its proximity to Maui. So we, we see this gradient of, of fishing impacts across the state, and basically where there's lots of people, we have fewer fish, and it's mainly a result of extensive fishing pressure. So one solution to this is marine protected areas. There are many, there's fisheries management um, regulations that the state has promulgated, and there's lots of ways to regulate fisheries. One of the most effective and cleanest is through marine protected areas like Molokini. The way MPAs work are, there's no fishing allowed in them for the most part, for most uh, really restrictive MPAs. What happens is you get more fish inside those MPAs, those fish get bigger. So they spill over out into the outlying areas where they can be fished, but they also produce a lot, of, lot more cakey. Um, large fish produce a disproportionate amount of, of eggs. Um, it's not like a big fish doesn't produce twice as many eggs as a fish half its size. It produces like 10 times as many eggs. So big fish are really important breeders and really important to the population and MPAs tend to harbor many more big fish than areas outside of their boundaries where fishing is prohibited, prohibit, permitted because we target big fish first and foremost. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we did an analysis of all or most of the marine managed areas in the state of Hawaii. And you can see we kind of color coded them by areas that are fully protected, highly protected, intermediate and, and provide low protection. And areas with low protection, intermediate protection, don't harbor a lot of fish biomass. That's why access there is resource fish. And we see where Molokini shows up, it's, um, you know, it's fully protected from fishing. Um, it's relatively small, so it's not gonna have the full complement of species that you would typically see on a long shoreline, but um, it ranks right up there very high, um, you know, close to Kolabe and Kalapapa 
for having high fish biomass. So it's a, it's a highly effective marine protected area. Okay, now to the case in point of Molokini. Um, as you all know better than me, established in 1977, it's got two zones, subzone A, where no fishing is allowed inside the crater, subzone B, outside where, where trolling is permitted. And <clears throat> this is um, one of Russell's camera shots um, from, let's see, September 21st at 9 a.m. And you can see it's, it's a relatively small area. There's 12 boats in there right now. And you can see the large number of people particularly concentrated inside um, towards the inside rim of the crater. But, but more importantly, Molokini is one of the most visited marine protected areas in the world with 300,000 visitors a year, particularly when you look at it on a per, per area basis. Um, it's not a big area. 300,000 people a year is a lot. It's also a, a big money generator as well. And, um, you know, we can get into that at some point, but it's probably undervalued as far as, um, you know, what could be charged for Molokini. It's an extremely unique place, not only for Hawaii, but globally. And as we've seen with other areas around the state, um, they're starting to increase the user fees at Hanama Bay um, and ways to regulate, you know, tourism, but still provide economic returns are things that should be thought about for, for Molokini. Okay, um, as Russell mentioned about Renshin about seven years ago, eight years ago now, we started a study to look at, um, you know, our mobile fish like omilu, alua, sharks, uku, things like that, are they being displaced inside of Molokini because of a large amount of non-consumptive human influences? Are you know, are a lot of tourists in the water, a lot of boats in the area, are they having a negative effect on the presence of the occurrence of some of these more mobile species inside of Molokini? And the way we did this was through acoustic telemetry. So upper left-hand corner are these small little acoustic receivers. We caught fish, alua, omilu, sharks, uh, and we surgically implanted these uh, acoustic transmitters inside of these fish. And then there were listening stations around Molikini and elsewhere around Maui and Koalavi where we were able to track the movement of these individual animals. So each individual transmitter has a unique ping code and that identifies individual fish as they swim by these receivers, the picture you see on the, on the right-hand side there. So for setup um, in the top left-hand panel there, that's Molokini. And those three black dots, R1, R2, R3, represent the acoustic receivers inside of, of Molokini Crater. And the four red dots on the back side there represent the other acoustic receivers that were um, outside um, in zone B. In addition to that, there was a bunch of receivers, those green triangles there around um, West Maui, South Maui, and even some around North Maui and, and Kahului. And there was also a receiver at Koalave. So based on this, we had a good network of acoustic receivers around Maui Nui that could be used to track the movement of these individual fish that we acoustically tag. So here's an example of a gray reef shark. And the way to read this is, um, on the bottom axis there, the horizontal axis, that's months. So that's about nine months worth of data. On the y-axis, the vertical axis is time of day. So the shaded areas from zero to about 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m., that's uh, dusk or that's, I mean, that's nighttime. And then again, from about 17, 1800 in the evening until um, midnight, that's also evening time. So the red dots represent detections of this gray reef shark in subzone B, and the black dots are subzone A. And you can see that this gray reef shark moved all over the place within Molokini. It didn't have a, a real preference for um, anything. It spent majority of its time in subzone B on, on the backside. Um, it did make some forays into subzone A, but um, not all that common. The other interesting thing to note here is that 
Um, this gray reef shark was picked up a number of times at the receiver at Koalave. So Molokini is an important transition point between Koalave and Maui, and a lot of fish use it as kind of a, a, a you know a signpost or a stop sign as it's migrating around Maui Nui, and that's an, you know another important finding that we found from this study. So here's the species that we really focused on. Um, this is Omilu, and again um, you can see. Uh, nighttime bands in the bottom and the top and daytimes in the middle there. And unlike the gray reef shark, the omilu was, is very diurnally or daytime active. It spent almost all of its time actively, actively inside the crater during the day. It, it moved to the backside, zone B, at night, but almost exclusively during daytime hours it spent its time inside the crater. And, and that's pretty typical of a mulu elsewhere, much more so than a lua and other predators where it's really a daytime feeder and a daytime predator. So the five different species that we looked at were a mulu, a lua, white tip shark, gray reef shark, and uku. And you can see they all have different amounts of what we call residency inside Molokini. So um, by far, a mulu was the most resident of all of the predators that we looked at. It spent almost all of its time at Molokini. Alua, also a fair amount, but not as much. White tips, um, again, fairly resident. And then the gray reef sharks, and particularly the uku, moved around quite a bit and didn't really call Molokini home exclusively. We also looked at, at vessel noise. There was a hydroacoustic receiver on the bottom there. And then, um, so on that horizontal axis is, is time of day. The number of vessels is on the vertical axis. You can see the blue bars there. Um, peak times are, you know, 8, 9, and 10 a.m. or when most of the vessels were there. And that correlates really strongly with the amount of noise levels that you see um, with inside the crater. So more boats, more noise. And then when we looked at the proportion of Omilu present versus the number of vessels, something very interesting shows up. So when there's a small number of vessels in Molokini, anything less than about five or so, and they're, they're fairly you know, prevalent inside the crater. They're moving around quite a bit and um, their, their presence is, is there. As you get more vessels, anywhere between five and 10, this number starts to decline. And then anything over about 10 to 12 vessels in Molokini at any one given time seems to you know, significantly affect the presence of a Milu seen inside Molokini Crater. And we also looked at the number of boats um, versus not only Omilu, but also Alua, Uku, and the white tip reef sharks. And we focus this just on the time of day when. Um, you know, the, the peak time when boats were there. And like we showed previously for Omilu, for Alua and for Uku, we also see, you know, a pretty strong negative correlation between the number of boats and the presence of these predators inside of, of subzone A in Molokini. So um, what's happening with Omilu? Are, are they moving? Are they being displaced? What, what's going on? If we look at that first bar there, that's looking at a low number of vessels, anywhere from zero to eight vessels. And you see the, um, the counts of Omilu, Bluefin, Trevally present. Um, that big blue section there, they're sending almost all of their time in subzone A when there's a small number of boats present and a, a little bit of time in subzone B. When there's a moderate number of boats there between nine and 16, they kind of split the difference. Um, they still spend a fair amount of time in subzone A, but they're spending a greater proportion of their time in subzone B. When you get any, a large number of vessels there, anywhere between 17 and 25 vessels, the amount of time that they spend in subzone A is quite limited. They're in subzone B a fair amount of time, but they've also been displaced in, ge in general from from the area, the, the overall size of that box is smaller. So as Russell mentioned at the beginning, we had this unprecedented opportunity to look and see 
how what Moldakini was like in the absence of people there. We would never be able to do this <laughs> from a financial perspective. Um, and so COVID provided this unique opportunity to see what Moldakini would look like, how the fisher would respond um, if no people were there. So take it away, Kevin. All right, awesome, thanks, Alan. Um, so we, we quickly uh, put together this project uh, during COVID in order to, to gather uh, the information during the lockdown. And of course, we would then be able to compare it to before because Alan and Russell and others had been conducting work there for quite a number of years. And then we would be able to also measure after the end of the lockdown to see what happened um, once everything got back to normal. This is a figure um, generated by um, Laura Godzik from our team. Um, and it shows the, the number of visitors per month from 2013 up through the present time. And so we're hovering at sort of 7,000 to 10,000 visitors per month uh, in the last decade. You can see the seasonal cycle um, with the, uh, the higher values during the summertime. And then in the yellow box, that's the time of the COVID pandemic. And so, of course, you can see a really, really precipitous drop in the number of visitors, almost down to zero. And then a fairly, once the, um, once the quarantine started getting relaxed, then the number of visitors started to recover fairly rapidly um, in the latter part of the pandemic. And then um, into now, we're, you know, we're back to uh, more business as, you, as usual conditions now. This is a photograph uh, that I think that Whitney captured during the early part of the lockdown when there was basically zero traffic happening at Molokini. And this is a pretty unusual situation because this is a large school of Karen Jordi's for Dow. It's a jack closely related to the Omilus and the Aluas. And this is a species that is known to exist in the area, but had not been seen on the inside of the crater in large numbers like this. So this is an indication that there are animals in the system that would like to be utilizing this habitat that are not utilizing it, uh, probably because of the high level of human activity that is kind of ongoing all of the time. And it takes a little bit of time from the cessation of, of human activity before these animals are going to realize, hey, it's gotten real, real quiet and calm. Maybe we can park our nose in here and start checking this out. Um, so it requires probably something on the order of a month or some months before all of the organisms are going to realize and feel bold enough to come into these areas that formerly had very, very high levels of human activity. Um, this is the uh, Litteratus, which is an herbivore. This is a really, really large school. Um, will surprise nobody in this presentation that Molokini has larger schools of fishes like this than, than fished areas. Um, Herbivores like this species are very, very important in consuming algae, which are competing for with coral larvae for landing spots. So having very, very robust populations of herbivores is important for the health of the coral reef. So this is an article that, um, that covered the research uh, and noted that with the with this quiet period at Molokini that there were fishes coming back in and using this habitat um, and that the size of the fishes was was larger um, and more predators were coming in 
So this is, uh, this is data gathered by Diver Survey, which shows the biomass of fishes. And we're starting here before the pandemic in 2018. So that's kind of the, we're gonna get a before, during, and after. The biomass prior to the pandemic is hovering around the kind of 80, 100 level through 2018 and 2019. And then you can see in 2020, during the pandemic, there's a, a sharp increase in biomass. When we get into the latter part of 2020, which remember that's when uh, the, the quarantine had already been lifted and there had been a resumption of tourism. The biomass then goes back down into the, the amounts that were seen by the divers prior to the pandemic. So this is on a, a time scale of just a few years from, you know, from 2019, 2020, 2021. These differences are due to the behavior of the animals either being displaced from the crater by high amounts of human activity or then coming back in during this quiet period of COVID. So this is a, this is a pattern that is driven by the habitat use choices of the animals that are responding to the level of, of human activity. This is a, a graph. Uh, it's kind of a fancy terminology. It's a principal coordinate analysis, which is trying to take a multidimensional situation and represented in two dimensions so that we can actually see it on a graph. And what it's telling us is the species that are driving changes between the different time periods. And the most important thing to note on this is that for the time period of, of early 2020, when the lockdown was in full force, the species that are driving changes in the fish community are the current, the, the jacks. And so if you look down on the lower right hand side, you can see that that fur dow, the Karen Jordy's fur dow or the bar jack, and then the alua were driving changes in the fish community because they were utilizing Molokini at higher levels than had been seen in the other time periods before and after. So the, the Omilu is the species that was most affected by human activity. And that's, as Alan described earlier, that's because this is the predator that has the highest usage of the inside part of, uh, of Molokini, the subzone A. Uh, so this species is the one that has the greatest overlap with human beings. So this is a photograph after the resumption uh, uh, of activities once the quarantine had been lifted. And uh, probably everybody remembers the, the recovery of visitation to Hawaii was really, really rapid, partly driven by the fact that international tourism was still shut down uh, and, and there was an enormous demand uh, from particularly from the mainland United States for people to go on vacation somewhere. And of course, everybody wants to come to Hawaii. So we received a very, very large amount of visitation very, very quickly once that quarantine was lifted. In the center lower part of this photograph, you can see Alan conducting a survey and all around him are the, the snuba and scuba um, people who are enjoying Molokini on their vacation. Um, this is quite a high level of, of, of human density and of bubble noise uh, and splashing around. So it's possible that this level of human activity is the kind of thing that might be displacing predators such as Omilu from the inside habitat of Molokini. So this is a graph that shows the detections from our, our most recent study that was conducted during and after the pandemic or during and after the lockdown. And on the vertical axis, we're showing the detections of Omilu per day. 
And then on the horizontal axis, we're showing the number of people that were present at that time. And you can see that on the very, very left side of the graph, where the number of people is very close to zero, we have this very, very dark area that is showing that we have really, really large numbers of detections of Omilu. So this is, a, this is the time when everything was locked down, when there were almost no vessels visiting, and there was an extremely high detection of Omilu uh, in the crater at that time. And then as tourism resumed and the total number of people started to come back to normal, there was a fall off in the use of that habitat by Omilu. So just in, uh, by way of comparison, the, the amount of activity on the inside of Molokini during kind of business as usual conditions is, is pretty high. And anecdotally in that photograph, you're not seeing a, a large school of predators Comparing that to the photograph on the lower right, this is a time when there had been no visitation to Molokini for several months. And that's that school of barred jacks that are utilizing that inside shallow habitat. Um, so there's a, a pretty big contrast in, in predator habitat use between those two time periods. Now we're looking at a graph again of the biomass of fishes through time. But notice on this graph, now we're starting in 2002. So on that previous graph that we showed, we were only looking from 2018 to 2021. So now we're looking at a much, much larger time period. So this is two decades of change in fish communities. And what you can see in this graph is, if you look at the the herbivores represented at the top uh, by the surgeon fish. There's a, a moderate decline in the herbivores. Now, if you look at the line for the, for the predators represented by the omilu, that's the, the black dots, there's quite a dramatic decline in those species over this 20 year period. In contrast, the invertivores, which uh, is represented by the moo, as well as the planktivores, which is represented by the trigger, those species are not really showing very much change over this 20 year time period. So in contrast to that other graph that was only showing a couple of years, this graph showing two decades of change is likely representing large scale changes in the populations of these, these groups of fishes that are driven most likely by fishing and changes in the total population size of these species. So over that 20 year period, with the growth of human population and the increase in fishing throughout the state of Hawaii, we've had a decrease in highly desirable and targeted fish like Omilus and Aluas, a, a, a moderate decrease in those herbivores, but not any significant changes in the invertivores or the planktivores. So these are photographs representing some of the some of the animals that you can see when you visit Molokini, and this is this is why Molokini is such an amazing and special place, and it's why so many tourists want to go and visit Molokini because people know that it's a really amazing and special place. Um, it's Molokini is with its larger numbers of animals, it actually has a lot of the ecological functions that we want to have on our reefs, like huge roving schools of herbivores that are cleaning up all of the algae. Um, very, very high live coral cover. Um, much healthier reefs at Molokini than you can see in many, many other parts of the state. Uh, so this is, this is what we want to protect and to, to improve uh, through new ideas in, in management. So in conclusion, we were able to take advantage of the very unfortunate situation that the COVID pandemic caused, which resulted in 
this very dramatic decrease in human activity at Molokini in order to gather data that we had never been able to gather before uh, of, of fish behavior without human beings being present. The fish biomass increased in particular the predatory species which had been more strongly displaced from the inside of the crater by human activity. And those, of course, those predatory species are the ones that we're targeting most heavily and are, that are more likely to be afraid of people. Uh, when the tourism resumed, we saw the patterns go back to the levels prior to the pandemic. Um, so that's reflecting the changes in behavior of those animals as a result of the human activity, that displacement from the, the shallower habitats. So those types of non-consumptive uses, contrasting consumptive as in fishing or non-consumptive as in the effects of human presence and activity and vessel activity, uh, those need to be considered in the overall management of managed areas throughout the state. And so hopefully uh, the data that we were able to gather will be helpful in, in planning statewide into the future. And we have so many people to thank who helped us out on this project that um, it will probably take a while for you all to read through that very, very long list of people who were so incredibly generous and giving of their time and their efforts and assets, vehicles, houses and apartments, um, filling our tanks for us, uh, taking us out on boats. So many, many thanks to everybody who was so generous in contributing to this project, including uh, Maui Nui Marine Resources Council and the contributors to that, that funding effort that they held for us.